Hello, everyone. My name is Van de Keizer. I'm a neuroradiologist at Ghent University Hospital in Belgium. And you are now watching a video on imaging of pediatric brain tumors. Because it's a long presentation, I will split it in three parts. The first part will be about pediatric brain tumors in the posterior fossa. Uh, when confronted with a brain tumor on imaging, you should always ask yourself three questions. The first question is, how old is the patient? Because the kind of brain tumors you encounter in children is totally different compared to the brain tumors you find in adults. Where is the tumor located? Because brain tumors tend to have a very specific differential diagnosis based on the location, which explains why I am now focusing on posterior fossa tumors, for example. And lastly, what does the tumor look like on imaging? If you answer these three questions, you will arrive at a reliable diagnosis or differential diagnosis. Now, there's a huge difference in the spectrum of brain tumors you can see in children compared to adults, but even in the pediatric population, you will see that there are some tumors that are mainly found in very young children, such as infants and toddlers. Other tumors are more prevalent in school-aged kids and teens and brats. And lastly, we uh, also have some tumors in adolescents and young adults. So even the pediatric population is not a homogeneous population. We will see differences in the kind of tumors depending on the age of the child. Now, the spectrum of brain tumors you're going to encounter in children is, and I am repeating myself, totally different compared to adult patients. First of all, what is missing here on this pie chart? Metastasis. Metastasis are the most frequent brain tumor in adults, but are very, very infrequent in children. They are here hidden in other. They constitute about 1% or maybe 1.5% of pediatric brain tumors. And when a child has cerebral metastasis, the most likely primary will be a neuroblastoma. So metastases are rare in children. The most frequent kind of tumors in children are the glial tumors, tumors derived from glial cells. And these constitute about 50%, about half of pediatric brain tumors. Now, the kind of glial tumors we find in children is not comparable to the kind of glial tumors we find in adults. In adults, the most frequent glial tumor is a glioblastoma. A glioblastoma is rare in children. Astrocytomas and oligodendrogliomas characterized by an ADH mutation. And in the case of oligodendrogliomas, a 1P19Q codeletion are also very infrequent in children. The spectrum of glial tumors in children is totally different. So they are not the same as in adults. For starters, the most frequent glioma in children is the pilocytic astrocytoma, which is a very benign tumor, a WHO grade one tumor. The high grade gliomas and low grade gliomas are diffuse gliomas which means that they are not sharply circumscribed from the surrounding brain parenchyma, but tend to infiltrate the brain parenchyma. Diffuse gliomas also occur in adults, see, and constitute astrocytoma, oligodendroglioma, glioblastoma. In children, gliomas tend to have very weird names. For instance, the most frequent one is the high-grade glioma H3, uh, H3Q27 altered diffuse midline glioma. So I had to think uh, about the name uh, because it's so difficult. And they have these weird names because the name is based upon certain molecular characteristics of these tumors. So this is just an introduction. So that's just suffice to say that gliomas and children tend to have weird names. 
and the high-grade gliomas are, in the majority of cases, more than half of cases, located in the brainstem, which is uh, different from what we see in adults. In adults, the most frequent glioma is the glioblastoma, and glioblastomas are mostly located in the supratentorial brain parenchyma and are infrequent in the brainstem or the cerebellum. Uh, then let's move on. Another big group of tumors in children are pituitary tumors. And contrary to adults, the craniopharyngioma is the most frequent cellar or rather supracellar tumor in children. Another pretty big group in children are the embryonal tumors, which constitute about 10% of pediatric brain tumors. And uh, the embryonal tumors are a group of very aggressive, highly malignant tumors. And the most frequent one of those is the so-called medulloblastoma. And then we have a large group of other tumors, notice that meningeal tumors like meningioma are very infrequent in children. Nerve sheet tumors like schwannoma or two, when you see them, you have to consider the possibility of a genetic syndrome like neurofibromatosis type 2. And then we have some tumors which are infrequent, even in children, but are nevertheless most frequent in the pediatric population like germ cell tumors and choroid plexus tumors. Let's move on to the next slide. So in my approach, I'm going to approach this, this subject based on location. I'm going to start with tumors that are mostly found in the infratentorial structures. Then in the second and third part of the presentation, I will talk about tumors located in the supratentorial brain structures. Uh, we have a group of brain tumors that are specifically located in certain midline structures, uh, such as the pituitary region, hypothalamus, optic chiasm, and the pineal gland. And then we have tumors which are located in the hemispheric brain parenchyma. So let's start with part one of imaging of pediatric brain tumors, imaging of brain tumors and the posterior fossa. And when, it, uh, when talking about posterior fossa, we can make a distinction between tumors that arise in the cerebellar parenchyma, tumors that arise in the brainstem, and tumors that are found in the fourth ventricle. Let's start with the most frequent one of these tumors. This is a young patient, I can't remember the age, and we see that the patient has a large tumor uh, located in the right cerebellar hemisphere. On these T1 weighted images with gadolinium, we see that the tumor is composed of a solid enhancing nodule uh, with a very avid enhancement. And on these T2-weighted images, we can see that there is a large T2 hyperintense kist associated with the tumor located posteriorly of the enhancing nodule. These findings, a tumor in the cerebellum in a child consisting of an enhancing nodule and the cyst is basically pathognomonic for pilocytic astrocytoma. Pilocytic astrocytoma is the most frequent glioma in children. It is a very benign tumor. It belongs to the group of the circumscribed glial tumors, meaning that the tumors do not infiltrate the surrounding brain parenchyma. And that also means that there is a high chance if the surgeon manages to resect the tumor in its entirety, that the patient is cured. It is the most frequent, not only most frequent glial tumor in children, but also the most frequent cerebellar tumor in children. It 
can pilocytic astrocytomas can actually be found at all ages, but the majority of patients with pilocytic astrocytomas are children and young adults, and 75% of these tumors are found in patients under 20 years of age, with a peak incidence between 5 and 15 years. So it's a tumor of school-aged children and young teenagers, so to say. Now, I'm talking about posterior fossa tumors in this presentation, and the majority of pilocytic astrocytomas are found, are found in the cerebellum. In the cerebellum, about 60% of these tumors are located in the cerebellum, but that's not the only place you can encounter them. Another typical location for pilocytic astrocytomas is the region of the hypothalamus and the optic chiasm, and about 25 to 30 percent of pilocytic astrocytomas are located here. And we will discuss these pilocytic astrocytomas in the second presentation on midline tumors. Uh, pilocytic astrocytomas can also occur in the brainstem, and in the brainstem, they are mostly located either in the mesencephalon or the medulla oblongata. They can also occur in the tectal plate. And lastly, they can also occur in the supratentorial brain parenchyma. This is an infrequent location. And when pilocytic astrocytomas are found in the supratentorial brain parenchyma, the patient tends to be older, an adult, generally a young adult, but an adult nonetheless. In children, this is an infrequent location. So, what is the typical imaging appearance of a cerebellar pilocytic astrocytoma? An enhancing nodule with a cyst. And I'm just showing you several different patients with the recurring imaging findings of a nodular lesion with a large cyst. Here once more, another one, another one, another one. So basically, we see the same basic pattern recurring in different patients. This is the textbook manifestation of a pilocytic astrocytoma. However, reality does not always confirm to textbooks. Pilocytic astrocytomas are the most frequent mild tumors in children, the most frequent cerebellar tumor in children, and they can have various, various imaging appearances beyond the typical view of a nodule with a large cyst. So we can see that there, is some there can be some variability in the size of the nodule. In this patient, the nodule is rather small and the cyst is big. This is a patient with a very large nodule and a smaller cyst. These tumors are located in the cerebellar hemispheres, but they can also occur in the vermis. In this patient, we see a very large enhancing, heterogeneously enhancing nodular lesion surrounded by eccentric cysts. Also notice that there is some faint enhancement of the cyst wall. We do not see enhancement of the cyst wall over here. And the cyst wall in pilocytic astrocytomas can be enhancing or non-enhancing. The both are possible. This is a patient in which the lesion is completely solid, contains some central necrotic regions, but we do not see large surrounding cysts like we see here and here. And lastly, this is a patient with a completely solid lesion with only faint enhancement. Nevertheless, this was also a pilocytic astrocytoma, although it doesn't look anything like these tumors. So, to conclude, you should always consider the possibility of a pilocytic astrocytoma when confronted with a cerebellar tumor in a child. This is a boy of 11 months old. It's a very young patient. And when we look at the sagittal images, the first thing that goes to our mind is not a specific diagnosis, but just, oh my God, in my case, uh, rather, so uh, just look at it. It looks like a very ugly, diffusely infiltrating tumor. And of course, we are worry worried that we are dealing with something high grade. However, when we look at the images in the axial plane, we see that the tumor on both T2 
and the one-weighted images is very sharply demarcated from the surrounding brain parenchyma. And although the tumor is heterogeneous and contains some areas of cysts and or necrosis, this was actually nothing but a pilocytic astrocytoma, a completely benign tumor. It's a large tumor in this patient, and the patient did have a hydrocephalus caused by obstruction of the fourth ventricle and the cerebral aqueduct by the tumor, but the tumor was completely resected and the patient uh, recovered completely and is still with us, luckily. So, once again, my message here is when you see any pediatric fossa posterior tumor, the first thing you should consider is, could this be a pilocytic astrocytoma? When not to consider pilocytic astrocytoma, well, I'm going to show you. This is another tumor. This is once again a child, I can't remember the age, let's say seven years old, with a hydrocephalus. We see that the lateral ventricles are enlarged. We see that the temporal horns of the lateral ventricles are enlarged. And here we see the cause on these T2 weighted images. We see a mass with some smaller peripheral cysts in the fourth ventricle. A mass with cysts, maybe it's pilocytic astrocytoma, but that's not the case because I moved on to a different topic. Some arrows to show you the hydrocephalus, an arrow to show you the tumor, and we're dealing with a child with obstructive hydrocephalus and a fourth ventricle mass. What is this? Let's look at some of the other sequences. These are T1-weighted images with gadolinium. These are axial T1-weighted images with gadolinium. Here we see the diffusion-weighted images with the ADC map and T2 star images. What do we see? We see a mass located in the fourth ventricle, probably arising from the anterior vermis. There are some small peripheral cysts with enhancement of the cyst wall. And centrally in the tumor, we see some signal loss on T2 star images. These could be small calcifications, but could also reflect microhemorrhagic components. The most conspicuous and most important imaging finding in this patient is the diffusion restriction. We see that the tumor has a high signal on the diffusion weighted images and a low signal on the ADC map indicating pathological diffusion restriction. This was a medulloblastoma. A medulloblastoma is a very malignant tumor. It's a WHO grade 4 tumor. And because this is a very hypercellular tumor composed of very small cells that lie very closely next to one another, the intercellular spaces in the tumor are narrow. Water molecules have very limited mobility in these narrow intercellular spaces, and as a consequence, the tumor is associated with diffusion restriction. Let's compare this tumor with the pilocytic astrocytoma. So this pilocytic astrocytoma was located primarily in the vermian brain parenchyma, these are T1-weighted images with gadolinium. These are diffusion images. And pilocytic astrocytomas do not show diffusion restriction. Medulloblastoma, on the other hand, arises from the anterior vermis, but will fill the fourth ventricle and be primarily and chiefly located in the fourth ventricle. And you're also associated with diffusion restriction. Uh, what can I tell you about medulloblastomas that I haven't said already? They are very malignant tumors. They belong to the embryonal tumors. And the embryonal tumors are a group of tumors that are composed of cells that resemble undifferentiated embryonal cells and probably arise from these undifferentiated embryonal cells. They are very aggressive. Medulloblastoma is the most frequent one of these embryonal tumors. And other members of this group are the atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor, and then a group of tumors which used to be called primitive neuroectodermal tumors or Keynets, but that name has been abandoned. 
I believe since 2007 or 2016, but is nevertheless still often used. Uh, so it's the most frequent malignant pediatric brain tumor. Remember, an adult glioblastoma is the most frequent malignant brain tumor, primary brain tumor, and children, that is the medulloblastoma. And it's a tumor that can also occur at all ages. You can have medulloblastomas in adults, but in adults, it's very infrequent. The majority of these tumors occur in children, with 80% of medulloblastomas occurring in patients under 17 years of age, with a median age of six years. So young children, school-age children. And there are four molecular subtypes. Um, since 2016, there has been a shift in the classification of brain tumors. In the old days, brain tumor diagnosis was based on the histopathological appearance of the brain tumor. In 2016, we saw a shift towards molecular diagnosis, in which the diagnosis of the tumor is more based on specific molecular markers that can be identified in the tumor. And this was uh, further elaborated in the 2021 WHO classification. Medulloblastoma has four molecular subtypes, and we will see that these subtypes tend to have certain areas of predilection and also certain age groups in which they tend to occur more frequently or infrequently compared to others. So let's start with the classical textbook medulloblastoma. The medulloblastoma you'll find in any neuroradiology handbook. Uh, we see a uh, heterogeneously enhancing mass located in the fourth ventricle and completely obliterating the fourth ventricle. The mass is a little heterogeneous on the two-rated images and has some small peripheral cysts. Here we see once again enhancement and the most conspicuous finding and the most important finding is the presence of diffusion restriction. Note that the tumor is hyperintense on diffusion and low on the ADC map. And I already explained you why we see diffusion restriction in medulloblastoma because medulloblastoma is a hypercellular tumor. It belongs to a group of tumors called the small blue round cell tumors, which are tumors that have basically very little in common with one another, except that when the pathologist looks at them, through the microscope, they all seem uh, to consist of very small, compact cells that stain blue. Um, after specific staining, I don't even know which one. I'm not a pathologist. Uh, belonging to the small blue round cell tumors or tumors like medulloblastoma, but also pineoblastoma, uh, central nervous system lymphoma or lymphoma in general, uh, Ewing sarcoma. So it's not even just central nervous system tumors. Uh, and the reason the tumor is diffusion restricted is because there are very narrow intercellular spaces between these very small compact uh, tumor cells. Let's talk about the different subtypes. We have the VWNT or the wingless subtype. We have the sonic hedgehog subtype. So these refer to specific molecular markers that can be identified in the tumor. And then we have the group three and group four tumors. For group three and group four, no specific molecular markers have been identified yet. So each of these has uh, certain regions in the posterior fossa in which the tumor tends to occur and uh, also certain age groups in which they tend to occur. Let's start with the WNT subtype. This is a somewhat older patient. It was an adult patient even. I uh, can't remember the age. It was a young adult. And we see a T2 iso-intense, slightly hyper-intense maybe, tumor located in the region of the left middle cerebellar peduncle and cerebellar pontine angle. It contains a central cyst. We also see enhancement except in the central kystic region on T1-weighted images with gadolinium. 
And once again, the most important finding is the presence of pathological diffusion restriction. The tumor is hyperintense on diffusion weighted images and low on the ADC map. So this is a tumor on T2 weighted images, and this was a WNT medulloblastoma. So medulloblastomas can also occur in the region of the cerebellopontine angle, left middle cerebellum or uh, rather the middle cerebellar peduncle. And this is a location that we can, uh, can see in children, but also in adults. And if you have to have a medulloblastoma, let it be this subtype, because this is the subtype with the best prognosis. Nevertheless, it's still a very aggressive malignant tumor. So the tumor is broadly localized in the region of the Lushka foramen cerebellopontine angle, middle cerebellar peduncle. So this region basically. And why is that? Because this tumor is derived from cells that actually belong to precursor cells of the brainstem. And these migrate from the anterior vermis to the Lushka foramen to the posterolateral brainstem surface. So if some of these cells are arrested in their migration and then undergo malignant transformation, that explains why we can see these WNT medulloblastomas in the region of the Lushka foramen. However, since these tumors arise from the, or these cells arise from the anterior vermis, W and T medulloblastomas can also be seen centrally in the fourth ventricle. Basically, you can find them anywhere along this trajectory. So let's move on. Oh yeah, I indicated tumor for you, for those of you who had seen it. And also notice this tumor is exactly located in the region of the Lushka foramen. On these T1-weighted images with the gadolinium, we see here the plexus in the left Lushka foramen. We can also discern the plexus on the contralateral side, and the tumor is located laterally of the plexus in the Lushka foramen. So a typical location, and also notice the diffusion restriction of the tumor. This is the second subtype, the sonic hedgehog subtype. Once again, we see a tumor that is iso-intense on T2-weighted images, iso-intense to the cerebellar cortex, contains small suits or areas of necrosis, has some perilesional edema. This tumor has basically no contrast enhancement whatsoever. And unpopular opinion, but I believe that uh, the value of contrast in the differential diagnosis of brain tumors, especially pediatric brain tumors, is overrated and diffusion is the most important sequence there is. And it is proven here because the tumor is very hyperintense on diffusion weighted images with low signal on the ADC map. This is diffusion restriction. This is a medulloblastoma located in the cerebellar hemisphere. And that is a typical location for the sonic hedgehog subtype of medulloblastoma. These are located in the cerebellar hemispheres. These are two sonic hedgehog subtype medulloblastomas. Both patients were not children, but young adults, because this is another subtype that can be found in adult patients, which tend to be then younger adults. Both patients were in their early 30s. And notice that, that in the two patients, the characteristics on T1-weighted images with gadolinium are completely different, proving my point that the value of contrast sequences is a bit overrated, in my opinion. Here, there is no contrast enhancement whatsoever, or very, very faint. And here, the tumor is strongly enhancing. What both tumors have in common is pathological diffusion restriction. Both tumors are very diffusion restrictive, and both were medulloblastomas. The sonic hedgehog subtype is a medulloblastoma type that is mainly seen in either infants or in adults, and it's a tumor with an intermediate prognosis. So it's not so good as the WNT subtype, but not so bad as 
some of the classical uh, fourth ventricle medulloblastomas. And now we're moving on to the classical location, the fourth ventricle. Basically, any subtype can occur there, okay? We also saw, we already saw that the WNT subtype can also be found in the fourth ventricle because the tumor cells uh, basically originate in the anterior vermis. SHH medulloblastomas can also occur in the fourth ventricle, but the classical ones or the so-called group three and group four medulloblastomas. These are both low uh, associated with diffusion restriction. We see a high signal on the DWI images. And in this patient, the first patient, we see that the medulloblastoma is strongly enhancing, a bit heterogeneously, small cyst or area of necrosis. But in the second patient, let's compare, we see very little enhancement. We see some patchy enhancement here inferiorly in the tumor. For the most part, this tumor is not enhancing or not so much. Classical fourth ventricle medulloblastomas with strong enhancement or typically group three medulloblastomas and the little enhancing medulloblastomas or typically group four medulloblastomas. Remember, nothing is absolute, nothing is 100% in radiology. These are just tendencies. But if you see a strongly enhancing medulloblastoma, chances are higher that it's going to be group three than group four. So the group three medulloblastomas or medulloblastomas that are mainly seen in infants and children. They have the worst prognosis and they are characterized or characterized rather by intense contrast enhancement. The group three medulloblastomas can be seen in all age groups, but mainly in children, less in adults and even less in infants, and they have an intermediate prognosis. So the group four medulloblastoma is actually the typical childhood fourth ventricle medulloblastoma. So let's summarize. We started with a comparison between a pilocytic astrocytoma, which shows no diffusion restriction, and then a classical fourth ventricle medulloblastoma can be any subtype, but mostly group three and group four. We also saw diffusion restrictive tumors in the area of the Lushka foramen, which tend to be WNT medulloblastomas and cerebellar hemispheric medulloblastomas, which are generally of the sonic hedgehog subtype. And what all medulloblastomas, independent of the molecular subtype, have in common is diffusion restriction. So my message is consider medulloblastoma in any pediatric posterior fossa tumor with diffusion restriction. Uh, what else do you have to look for in a patient with a suspected medulloblastoma? We see a young child with a fourth ventricle tumor that is avid contrast enhancement. This was a group three medulloblastoma. And do we see anything else? Be careful for satiety of search. These are the diffusion-weighted images confirming that it is a medulloblastoma. Let's zoom in a little bit and let's look a bit closer. We see contrast enhancement superficially of the tectal plate and also some contrast enhancement in the cerebellar fissures. This is leptomeningeal seeding and medulloblastomas are associated with a very high risk of leptomeningeal seeding. Leptomeningeal seeding can be seen in about 25% of children at diagnosis. So always look for possible leptomeningeal seeding in a child with a suspected medulloblastoma. Also do an MRI of the spine because these leptomeningeal uh, deposits can drop in the spine and be located as low as the sacrum. So always do an MRI of the spine and make sure it's the full spine. Okay, lookalikes. We have two children with similarly looking tumors located in the fourth ventricle. This is a four-year-old girl. This is a nine-year-old boy. 
we see a T2 iso intense compared to cerebellar cortex T2 iso intense tumor in the fourth ventricle in both patients. Let's look at some of the other sequences. Uh, this, in this nine-year-old boy, I'm already going to give you the diagnosis, this was a medulloblastoma. This is not a medulloblastoma, despite the fact that it looks a lot like a medulloblastoma. Let's look at the diffusion images. The tumor is hyper-intense on diffusion-weighted images, low on the ADC map. This is pathological diffusion restriction. There is heterogeneous enhancement. This could be a medulloblastoma with a preference for group 3 medulloblastomas, right? Except that it wasn't. This was an atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor. An atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor is also a pediatric brain tumor, very malignant, belonging to the embryonal tumors. So it's in the same family, tumor family, as the medulloblastoma. And it's a tumor that is mainly seen in very young children with a median age of two to three years. So if you see a tumor that looks a lot like medulloblastoma with diffusion restriction, but the child is very young, let's say a four year max, also consider the possibility of an ATRT. And the only imaging characteristic that might have been helpful in the diagnosis, well, age is always helpful, but let's ignore age, that's the presence of these peripheral cysts because ATRTs are often associated more often with these peripheral cysts on T2-weighted images or T1-weighted images with gadolinium than medulloblastomas. It's not 100% absolute for the differentiation, but it can be helpful when you're doubting. Uh, so let's summarize. I've already told this. It's a very malignant tumor, an embryonal tumor seen in very young children. 80% occur in children under four years of age with a median age of two to three. Important, we're going to encounter this tumor again when talking about supratentorial brain tumors because the tumor is not only found in the posterior fossa. Uh, about, oh, let's say, 50 to 60% are found infratentorially and about 40 to 50% in the supratentorial brain parenchyma. The infratentorial uh, ATRT can look a lot like medulloblastoma, especially when the tumor is located in the fourth ventricle. It's not only located in the fourth ventricle. I've now shown you, I've now shown you a fourth ventricle tumor, but it can also be located in the brain parenchyma with also a predilection for the cerebellar hemispheres and the lateral region. Uh, the tumor is often heterogeneous with diffusion restriction and leptomenin leptomeningeal seeding is very frequent. Uh, what was the main clue? That would have been the age of the patient, although the age is probably a bit borderline. I always say four-year maximum to consider it. It can also be found in somewhat older children, but the majority are found in children under H4 and the cysts. To summarize, consider an ATRT when you see a posterior fossa tumor with diffusion restriction in a very young child, four years of age maximum. And when you're considering ATRT, look if there are some peripheral cysts, although that is not the most important clue to the diagnosis. Uh, another look alike. We see two children. This is a girl, 32 weeks old, with a large mass in the fourth ventricle. This is a 10-year-old boy with a similar appearing mass in the fourth ventricle, some peripheral cysts. This boy had a medulloblastoma. The girl didn't. Let's look at some of the other imaging uh, sequences to see if we can see a difference. This is the girl. This is the boy. So when we look at the contrast images, and these are flare images with gadolinium, both humors are heterogeneously enhancing. So that's not very helpful. And the differential diagnosis, when we look at the diffusion images, we see that this tumor is not diffusion restrictive. And this one is 
this was a medulloblastoma and the upper tumor was an ependymoma. Ependymomas belong to the glial tumors and are tumors that are derived from the ependymal cells lying the ventricles and are many occur in the posterior fossa, typically located in the fourth ventricle. So let's also compare our sagittal images because these can also be very helpful in differentiating ependymomas from medulloblastomas. So both tumors tend to be located in the fourth ventricle, but medulloblastomas are more infiltrative. They fill the entire or tend to fill the entire fourth ventricle and are often unsharply demarcated from the surrounding brain tumors, while ependymomas often arise from the inferior part of the fourth ventricle and have what is called a plastic road pattern. They tend to fill the fourth ventricle like a cast or a cast. I don't really know if I pronounce it correctly. Cast, cast, but you know what I mean. They tend to grow through the foramen of Magendi, even through the foramen magnum, through the foramina of Lushka, and they will widen these foramina but uh, not really infiltrate them. So they have what is called a plastic growth pattern. Uh, this is another example, the same patient, but these coronal images very nicely, so these are sagittal images, these are coronal images, uh, very nicely show the tumor fitting the fourth ventricle like a cast and growing through the McCandy foramen. So a nice illustration of the plastic, so-called plastic growth pattern of ependymomas. And if I'm not mistaken, the next slide will be another example. And it is, these tumors are often very heterogeneous on all imaging sequences. T2-weighted images, T2-star images, T1-weighted images with gadolinium, as we see here. But notice that the tumor here arises from the inferior part of the roof of the uh, fourth ventricle, the inferior medullary vellum, and, and this is the tumor self-evidently, and goes through the foramina of Lushka and widens them, and also grows through the foramen of Magendi and even through the foramen magnum. So another nice example of the plastic growth pattern of ependymomas. So what can I tell you about ependymomas? Well, first of all, ependymomas, there isn't just one type. I've now shown you the textbook ependymoma, the one you will find in any neuroradiological handbook, but ependymomas are not solely found in the posterior fossa. The majority are found there, about 60%, but they can also occur in the supratentorial brain parenchyma, about 30%. And when they occur supratentorially, the majority are not even located in the ventricles, but in the brain parenchyma, extraventricularly, which is a bit bizarre, assuming that these tumors arise from ependymal cells. So probably these tumors arise from ependymal cells that got trapped in the brain parenchyma one way or another. I'm not sure. I don't know if anyone is sure. It's just a theory. But just keep it in mind, because that's a bit counterintuitive. We assume that these arise from ependymal cells, so we expect to see them in the ventricles. Well, if they occur supratentorially, and we will see those in the later presentations on hemispheric brain tumors, they are mostly not located in the ventricles. And lastly, ependymomas are also the most frequent intramedullary spinal cord tumor, and about 10% of ependymomas are spinal cord ependymomas. Now, all these tumors, depending on the location, have different molecular characteristics. And when we focus on the posterior fossa tumors, we can even discern two subtypes based on molecular characteristics. We have a subtype called the posterior fossa type P ependymomas, and these are the textbook ependymomas. These are the tumors located in the fourth ventricle along the midline arising from the inferior roof of the fourth ventricle, and these are mainly seen in 
older children and young adults. Median age is 20 years. So really adolescents, young adults, rather than children. Uh, tumor. And then we have the type A posterior fossa ependymomas. These are less frequent and are mainly seen in very young children, median age, two and a half years of age. These tumors are located in the fourth ventricle, but laterally, with um, the, the main focus of the tumor in the foramen of Luchka. And they tend to encircle the brain stem. They have a worse prognosis because of that, because they often encase critical neurovascular structures, uh, blood vessels, cranial nerves, and are difficult to operate. So a complete surgical resection is often difficult and not possible. I'm going to show you an example of a group A, posterior fossa ependymoma. First, look at the age of the patient. This is a two-year-old boy, and we see a slightly hyperintense tumor located in the fourth ventricle, but extending along the Lushka foramen to the uh, cerebellar, cerebellopontine angle region, uh, compressing the brain stem and also engulfing and encasing the basilar artery. We also see that on these images, these are located at the level of the medulla oblongata. This was the pons. And we see that the tumor completely fills the cerebellopontine angle and the prepontine cistern. So we can understand that this is not a nice tumor for a neurosurgeon to operate. When we, you know, when confronted with a tumor that looks a bit strange, one of the things that can help you is put your finger in the middle of the tumor and ask yourself, what is located there? Well, this is the Lushka foramen and a posterior fossa ependymoma type A is a tumor with typical uh, location of the tumor in the Lushka foramen. Uh, let's move on. This is the same patient. These are flare images showing you the heterogeneous nature of the tumor. And on these T1-weighted images, we can see the plastic growth pattern we know from ependymomas. The tumor grows through the foramen magnum anteriorly of the medulla oblongata and the cervical spinal cord. So what can I tell you about ependymomas? This is just uh, repeating what I told you already. It's a heterogeneous group of tumors with uh, differing locations. Majority are located in the posterior fossa, but can also be found supratentorially and in the spinal cord. In the posterior fossa, we have the type A's found in very young children, mean age two, three years. And uh, with the central point of the tumor, in the Lushka foramen, and then we have the type B e found in adolescents, young adults, and these are the classic fourth ventricle midline tumors. Both tumors have a plastic road pattern. Diffusion restriction is generally absent, except when the tumor is high grade. So ependymomas are mostly WHO grade two tumors, but they can also be anaplastic, and then they are grade three. And your anaplastic areas of diffusion restriction can be possible. Despite the fact that these tumors are less malignant than medulloblastomas, leptomeningeal seeding is nevertheless possible. So it is advisable to perform an MRI of the spine in patients suspected of having an ependymoma. Um, and let's compare. No, let's, uh, what's the key point here? If you see a fourth ventricular tumor in children or young adolescents with a diffusion restriction and a typical plastic growth pattern, consider ependymoma. So let's compare three tumors on sagittal T1-weighted images with gadolinium. This is our typical medulloblastoma with an infiltrative growth pattern. This is a typical ependymoma with a plastic growth pattern. What is this? Question mark, question mark, question mark. Uh, 
we might be inclined to say this will also be a medulloblastoma because there is no plastic growth pattern. However, this is the fourth ventricle and this tumor is not located in the fourth ventricle. This tumor is located in the vermis and has displaced the fourth ventricle. This was a pilocytic astrocytoma. Let's compare or oh, let's look at some of the other images. The two weighted images show a sharply uh, circumscribed tumor with some central and peripheral cysts, heterogeneous on flare. Uh, the, not the, the solid component shows heterogeneous enhancement, and the most important sequence, the diffusion weighted images are negative. So when we look at the midline images, we might be inclined to think it's a fourth ventricle tumor, but when it comes to brain tumors, always remember the age is important, but also the location. Is this tumor located in the fourth ventricle or in the brain parenchyma? It's a parenchymal tumor without diffusion restriction. Then pedocytic astrocytoma is the most likely diagnosis in a child. So let's move on. We've discussed tumors in the cerebellar brain parenchyma. We discussed tumors in the fourth ventricle. Let's move on to the brainstem. This is a six-year-old boy. And what do we see? We see a large, a rather sharply demarcated T2 hyperintense tumor in the pons, enlarging the pons, engulfing the basilar artery and almost completely encasing the basilar artery. The tumor contains some enhancing areas, but is for the most part not enhancing. Let's look at some of the other sequences. The T2-weighted images we've already shown you. These are the flare images. On the diffusion-weighted images, we see some areas with an increased signal on diffusion and a low signal on the ADC map reflecting diffusion restriction. But for the most part, the tumor is not diffusion restrictive and the same applies to the T1-weighted images. We see some areas that are enhancing, but for the most part, no enhancement. Now, if you were to tell me this is a brainstem glioma, you are correct. But remember the pie chart I've shown you at the start of this presentation, there are a lot of gliomas out there. Saying that this is a brainstem glioma isn't saying much. What kind of glioma are we talking about here? Which one is this? And that's important. This is a diffuse midline glioma, H3K27 altered. We are now dealing with the diffuse gliomas. And I told you at the start of the presentation, diffuse gliomas and children tend to have very weird names based on the, on the molecular characteristics of the tumor. The H3 histone shows some mutations in this tumor. And uh, as a consequence, they named this tumor after these mutations. H3K27 altered. Uh, glioma. The majority are located along the midline, mainly in the pons in young children, but they can also be located in supratentorial midline structures like the thalamus, and that is something mainly seen in older uh, children and in adolescents. Uh, and it's a diffuse tumor. So what was I telling you? So the majority of diffuse brainstem gliomas belong to the or are H3K27 altered tumors. These are very malignant, very aggressive tumors, WHO4, and they have a very poor prognosis. They are mostly found in the pons in young children, but can be found in other midline structures like the thalamus in older children and adolescents. And when you see them in the pons, typically the pons is enlarged and the tumor is already large at the diagnosis. There is displacement and engulfment of the basilar artery. Contrast enhancement is usually absent or minimal. So the case I've shown you is a bit exceptional in that regard that this tumor had some rather large areas of contrast enhancement, but that you see no enhancement whatsoever that does not speak against this diagnosis, on the contrary. 
And some diffusion restriction is possible, but for the most part, these tumors are not diffusion restrictive. Let's compare this tumor to a different tumor. So what do we see? We see here a patient, a child, with a nodular, mostly enhancing lesion located in the medulla oblongata. This tumor consists of a solid component, and then there's a central kistic component or an area of necrosis, also seen here on these magnified axial T1 weighted images. When you look at the axial T2 weighted images, it's a bit more difficult, but this is the solid component of the tumor. And then here we have the kistic components of the tumor. What is this? This was a pilocytic astrocytoma. At the start of this presentation, I told you that pilocytic astrocytomas can also occur in the brainstem, preferentially in the mesencephalon and the medulla oblongata. They can also occur in the pons, but when they do, contrary to the diffuse midline glioma, the H3K27 altered diffuse midline glioma, they tend to be smaller, solid lesions, and generally completely enhancing, but they do not always enhance like we see here. This is another pilocytic astrocytoma of the medulla oblongata, and we see a large, sharply demarcated lesion located uh, centrally and somewhat lateralized to the left in the middle of oblongata. Uh, it has an exophytic growth pattern, and pilocytic astrocytomas in the middle of oblongata often have an exophytic growth pattern. This tumor has some patchy, irregular enhancement, uh, also seen here, very faint, but it's for the most part not enhancing. This is the pilocytic astrocytoma. So pilocytic astrocytomas in the brainstem can have various imaging appearances. They can have the classical appearance also seen in the cerebellum, uh, cerebellum rather, of a nodule with a cyst. They can also be completely solid. They can be completely enhancing, or they can be not enhancing or just faintly enhancing. Just remember that pilocytic astrocytoma should be in your differential diagnosis and your first consideration when seeing a tumor in the mesencephalon or the middle of longata of a child, especially if the tumor is very sharply demarcated and has a somewhat exophytic growth pattern. And these arrows show you the areas of enhancement. So, oh yeah, everything I told you is also found on this slide. So they are often located in the oblongata, another location is encephalon. They can extend into the upper cervical cord. They often have an exophytic growth pattern and they often have sharp borders and are non-infiltrative. Now, pilocytic astrocytomas in the brainstem are often associated or more often seen in patients with neurofibromatosis type 1. This is a patient with neurofibromatosis type 1. We see areas of increased signal intensity on the flare images and the globus pallidus bilaterally. These are so-called UBOs, unidentified bright objects. Other authors call these phases, uh, focal areas of increased signal intensity, whatever. It's a finding we often see in children with neurofibromatosis type 1. The exact pathological nature of these lesions is still unclear, but they are benign, they are not neoplastic, and they tend to diminish over time as a child grows older. A tumor that is strongly associated with neurofibromatosis type 1 is the opticus glioma. We see here thickening of the right optic nerve. These are magnified T2-weighted images centered over the optic nerves here seen in the coronal plane. And this was an opticus glioma. And the patient also has a sharply demarcated, completely enhancing nodule in the pons. The lesion was not operated upon. We are uh, just following this up. We are doing a weight and scan approach. Um, the tumor does not uh, seem to grow over the MRIs that have been performed over the course of one year. And we believe this is probably a small pilocytic astrocytoma.
but we have no pathological confirmation. This is another patient. This patient has a very extensive UBOS on these flare images in the globus pallidus, the pulvinar of the thalamus, and also in the fornix bilaterally. Oh, I was expecting arrows. And we also see a kystic lesion on the right side and the mesencephalon corresponding to a pilocytic astrocytoma. And the mesencephalon is another preferential location of pilocytic astrocytomas in the brainstem. Now, let's move on to the one of the last cases on brainstem tumors. What is this? We see on these T2-weighted images a T2 hyperintense uh, space-occupying lesion in the medulla oblongata. There tends the borders are a bit unsharp. Yeah, it's a lesion in the medulla oblongata. There is some enlargement of the medulla oblongata. There is some exophytic growth. So we are inclined to say this is a pilocytic astrocytoma. The tumor has this somewhat bizarre appearing uh, irregular contrast-enhancing component, but for the most part, the tumor is not enhancing. And uh, based upon the location, the fact that it is a child, we are inclined to say, well, pedocytic astrocytoma, but, but what is bothersome for me is that the borders of the tumor are somewhat unsharp here. And pedocytic astrocytomas have no infiltrative growth pattern. Also here on these T1-weighted images, this tumor is not sharply demarcated. Um, I wasn't sure. I said it could be pilocytic astrocytoma, but the pathologist proved me wrong. This was a diffuse glioma, low grade, so it's not a high grade H3K27 diffuse midline glioma, which mainly occur in the ponds in children. So luckily, it was a low grade. It was a so called MAPK pathway altered low gray pediatric glioma. I told you at the start of this presentation, diffuse gliomas in children have strange names. Uh, this entity was introduced to the WHO 2021 classification. So it's basically a very recent entity. Uh, and as a consequence, there aren't a lot of studies on the imaging appearances of this glioma subtype. So what can we tell about it? Pathologically, the tumor has no ADH mutation. So ADH mutations are mainly found in um, adult type diffuse glial tumors like HDA mutant astrocytoma and oligodendroglioma. The tumor has no mutations or alterations in the H3 histone, which is something we see in the H3K27 diffuse midline gliomas. So we do not have the molecular characteristics of these high-grade gliomas. Histopathologically, these tumors have no signs of malignancy, and the good people of the WHO are not sure yet if they should consider this a WHO grade one or grade two tumor. As I said, it's a recently introduced entity. So when it comes to the typical imaging features, these still have to be determined. So it's interesting because we just have to keep an open mind. We are confronted in this patient with a tumor that does not have the typical location of an H3K27 altered midline glioma. It has a typical location of a brainstem pedocytic astrocytoma, but tends to look a bit more infiltrative than what we would expect. And just keep in mind that other gliomas, like these low-grade pediatric gliomas, can also occur in the brainstem. So there are more tumors to be found in the brainstem than just the diffuse midline glioma or the H3K27 um, what am I saying, or the pilocytic astrocytoma. So we're almost finished with pediatric brain tumors in the posterior fossa. This is a patient with a ventriculomegaly, probably a chronically compensated arrested hydrocephalus and a neurofibromatosis type 1 patient. We see some UBOs in the basal ganglia. And this patient had what 
seemed like a small web in the city bill aqueduct. And this is what we said. We said, well, we think this is an aqueductal web, a congenital aqueductal stenosis, which has caused this chronic hydrocephalus or chronic ventricular megaly in the patient. But a couple of years later, what do we see? This is an evolutive lesion. This lesion has grown. So this is a tumor. It hasn't grown much. Mm, two years have passed. If this were a high-grade lesion, well, it probably would have exploded by now, but it hasn't. This is probably either a pilocytic astrocytoma or these MAPK pathway altered low grade gliomas also tend to occur in the tactile plate. So it could be one of those. A uh, patient was not uh, operated. I believe they did a third ventriculostomy, but probably not here yet because we don't see flow voids through the bottom of the third ventricle. But just keep in mind, and in retrospect, when we look at these images, we could say, well, maybe this was the tumor. Maybe we should have seen this because the signal is a little bit increased in a micronodular fashion. Uh, so let's summarize. When it comes to brainstem gliomas, we can make a distinction between two types. We can have diffuse brainstem gliomas, and the majority of those will be located in the pons, will be high grade, and will be H3K27 altered diffuse midline gliomas. Or your gliomas can be focal, sharply demarcated. They can be completely enhancing a kist uh, with an enhancing nodule. They can be solid with some areas of enhancement, whatever. These will mostly be pilocytic astrocytomas, tend to be located mostly in the mesencephalon or medulla oblongata. And there is an association with neurofibromatosis type 1. So that concludes my presentation on imaging of brain tumors in the posterior fossa in children. So we started with three questions. How old is the patient? Where is the tumor located? And what does the tumor look like? What should we remember from this presentation? When it comes to the first question, how old is the patient? We have seen pedocytic astrocytomas, and these can occur at all ages, but are mostly found in school age children and young teenagers with a peak incidence of uh, five to 15 years of age. We have seen medulloblastomas. These can occur in all ages, can be found in infants, can be found in adults, but for the most part, they are found in toddlers and school age. I'm sorry, I'm having some pronunci pronunciation difficulties school-age children with a mean age of six years. Then we have the atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumors, which are mainly found in very young children, four years of age maximum, with a mean age of two to three years at diagnosis. And lastly, we have ependymomas. And there are two subtypes. We have the type A posterior fossa ependymomas, mainly found in very young children, mean age two to three years. And we have the type B posterior fossa ependymomas, mainly found in older children and young adults. So that concerns the question age. Where is the tumor located? Well, if the tumor is located in the cerebellar hemispheres, First thing you should consider is pedocytic astrocytoma, but if the tumor shows diffusion restriction, also consider a sonic, he sonic hedgehog medulloblastoma. And if it's a very young child with a tumor in the cerebellar hemisphere with diffusion restriction, consider ATRT. Uh, then we have for the ventricle tumors, consider medulloblastomas, ATRTs, and ependymomas, and once again, Diffusion restriction is important for the distinction between these two embryonal tumors uh, with an ependymoma. And we have brainstem tumors. Ask yourself, is it a diffuse tumor? And if it's a diffuse tumor, mainly located in the pons, it's probably a diffuse. 
HQK27 midline glioma in its focal, probably pilocytic gastrocytoma, and these are mainly located in the middle of the oblongata and mesencephalon. And I know I repeat a lot, but repetition is important. It helps you memorize things. Uh, then, once again, when it comes to the cerebellar hemispheres, pilocytic gastrocytoma, sonic, sonic hedgehog medulloblastoma, and ATRT, all your main differential diagnoses. For the fourth ventricle, differential diagnoses are medulloblastoma, HCRT, and posterior fossa type B ependymoma. Then brainstem tumors are mostly brainstem gliomas. And when the tumor is located in the area of the Lushka foramen, consider medulloblastoma, HTRT, or type A posterior fossa ependymomas. So, and the last question, what does the tumor look like? Well, we've seen some very helpful imaging clues in the di differential diagnosis. The textbook imaging appearance of a pilocytic astrocytoma is of an enhancing nodule with a cyst. Uh, when the tumor shows diffusion restriction, always consider an embryonal tumor like medulloblastoma or HTRT. Um, less frequent anaplastic ependymomas can show areas of diffusion restriction, but it's less frequent. And lastly, if the tumor has a plastic growth pattern, consider ependymoma. So that concludes the first part of my presentation on imaging of pediatric brain tumors. Uh, I'm going to continue with supratentorial pediatric brain tumors, but not now. It will be uploaded uh, tomorrow or maybe some days later, whatever. If you like this presentation, if you have any comments, feedback, or questions, just leave a message in the comments section, uh, or you can also send me an email, neuroradiology.online at gmail.com. Thank you very much.